coming up on Judge Render's Crime Stories. Police work against the clock to catch a killer. We sent a forensic scientist down there. To the naked eye, you probably couldn't see a lot of blood spatter going up the stairs. There was obviously a cleaner. The person who had obviously done the cleaning was obviously trying to hide the fact that these blood stains were there to cover up the fact that something brutal had happened that night. And later, an online stalker leaves a woman and her family living in fear. It starts with that one nasty message, and before you know it, you're in... Someone's controlling your life. There were 732 homicides recorded in England and Wales in the year to December 2018 the highest in more than a decade. The victim in this case is yet another addition to this appalling statistic. Fifteenth of June, 2018. The body of a man is found in Dale Park on the Orchard Park estate in Hull. Hello? Police. Senior investigating officer Chris Calvert from Humberside Police Major Crime Team was assigned the case. The body was in a poor state. It had some decomposition due to the, the weather in June. It was quite warm at the time, and there was numerous injuries around the body. It was obviously a suspicious death. Our initial lines of care was obviously to identify this man, and we also needed to know how he died. My name's Michael Much. I'm a journalist for the Whole Daily Mail. It caused quite a bit of a shock because it was a body that was left uh, dumped in a park and it's not every day that, that, that happens. Three days later, uh, we found out the name was uh, Rolandus Poskus. Rolandus Poskus was 52 years old and originally from Lithuania. He was eventually identified through fingerprints. That led us to build up the lifestyle of this man. By building up the victimology, how they lived, we often find out how they died. We found out that he'd actually visited the hospital a few days prior with an injury to his head, which he said was caused through falling over through drink. And through there, we uh, found his next of kin to be Janina Meliskina, his partner. He'd been over in the UK for about 15 years. He moved over here with his partner at the time and lived in uh, the Southern Counties. When they split up, he moved up to Hull. He was working for a staffing agency when he met Janina Meliskina, and uh, that was in 2017, and they quickly moved in together. He'd been working for a recruitment agency, and people there had said he was a very funny, hard-working kind of guy, um, outgoing, and loved people and loved working with them. A forensic post-mortem of Rolandis' body revealed the extent of damage that had been inflicted. His injuries were horrendous. He had 27 rib fractures, which had collapsed into his lungs, causing the piercing in his lungs, causing massive internal bleeding, and that was the cause of his death. But as well as that, he had um, a nasty head injury that went right down to his skull. He had various bruises and gashes all over his body, uh, which the pathologist uh, stated was caused by some blunt force trauma, i.e. a weapon. Why had Rolandus been murdered, and who was responsible? The police tracked down Rolandus' next of kin, his partner Janina, at her place of work. I sent some officers to go and obviously tell her that Rolandus has been found dead. They were shocked by her reaction. She showed no emotion whatsoever. Um, and she looked confused. She was saying, well, has he been in a car accident? And then she told the officers that they had gone down to London um, and she hadn't seen him. Um, she immediately became a person of interest to me and I declared her a suspect and she was arrested for the murder of Rolandus Poskus. Janina was brought in for questioning. Her relationship with Rolandus was not conventional. Friends and neighbours, uh, we identified that it was a volatile relationship. Um, Rolandus did like a drink. They would have heated arguments while it's, they was in drink um, and that could be heard by the neighbours. She stated that Rolandus had taken her to work on the 12th of June. He picked her up at 4 o'clock and he was in drink. 
Um, he'd taken her home and gone straight to bed. Melanda's got out of bed about seven o'clock, uh, and at that time she stated they had a heated argument. And then Melanda's left shortly afterwards, taken his vehicle, his wallet, and his keys with him, and she hadn't seen him since. As part of the arrest process, Janina's phone was seized and checked by Detective Constable Richard Kirk. On the evening that she'd claimed she'd argued with Rolandus, she'd made an interesting call to her son, Mantus Punzius. With the phone communication, we were able to establish that Janina had contacted Mantus around about 1.15 in the morning, unusual time to call, so that raised our suspicions immediately. Mantus Punzius became a suspect and he was arrested. Why had Janina contacted Mantus in the early hours of the 13th of June? The police had started forensic work on the house where Rolandus and Janina lived, believing it could potentially be a scene of crime where Rolandus was murdered. We sent a forensic scientist down there. To the naked eye, uh, you probably couldn't see a lot of blood spatter going up the stairs. There was obviously a clean-up. Um, there was some smeared blood which they tried to clean up, but um, they haven't done a really good job. The person who had obviously done the cleaning, it was obviously trying to hide the fact that these blood stains were there to cover up the fact that something brutal had happened that night. So the CCTV in that area was immediately seized, immediately outside the property, and there is a civic camera. There was no CCTV at the back. The back of the property was an area of, in effect, wasteland, and then it's the main railway uh, line out of Hull. Now under caution and faced with telephone records, Mantis accepted that he had received a call from his mother. Mantis denied any involvement, saying he was his friend. He tried to blame some friends of his who were Russians, uh, and they said they were involved in his murder and his disappearance. He actually put himself at the scene, so it, it wasn't as if he was denying ever being there. The fact that he then put two other suspects in the frame kind of muddies the water to a certain extent. Janina continually uh, denied calling Mantis on that evening, even though the, the data from the phone showed that she did, um, and she continued to uh, deny any involvement in his death or any cleanup of the house. Both were giving completely different accounts as to what had actually happened, uh, and which was both were completely at odds with the evidence that we gathered in the case. It was down to police to use forensics and phone analysis to prove that the pair were involved in Rolandus's death. With a mobile phone, once it's switched on, uh, it will, in effect, talk um, to mass, the, the mass of that server, um, and it's what we call like it's a handshake with the mast, which will then provide us and provide the server uh, with a location for where that phone is at that time. Uh, so by Examining the phones and discovering that data, we were then able to place Janina and Mantis in relevant places at relevant times. Phone records also threw up the name of an associate who Mantis had called shortly before the attack. Police suspected that he had wanted some backup, anticipating a confrontation. Attention turned to the CCTV. Could it reveal what had taken place in the early hours of the 13th of June, 2018? Footage nine hours before the murder showed Rolandus and Janina arriving home in his black Saab car. Now police could fast forward to the time when they suspected the murder had taken place. We had footage of a vehicle being driven along and then in front of the house and out of, out of shot. We were able to identify from this footage that that vehicle uh, was a BMW vehicle, which we knew that Mantis owned, and at the time of arrest, we had seized from him. A matter of moments later, we could then see from the CCTV the front bedroom light going on, which from our forensic scientists we'd established was the start or the scene of the assault. Why would Mantis have killed Rolandus? What was the motive behind this attack? Police believed it had to be related to the argument between Rolandus and Janina. We knew it was a volatile relationship. We knew uh, Mantis had a very close relationship with his mother. So my uh, a hypothesis was they'd had an argument. She'd run a son and said, come and sort this out. 
Whatever triggered that call was essentially the call that sealed Rolandis' doom. The forensic scientist said the main assault would have taken place in the bedroom where Rolandis was sleeping and uh, under the windowsill in the main bedroom. The attack was sustained and highly aggressive. This wasn't just trying to get Rolandis out of the way. This was teaching him a very severe lesson. And then the assault carried on all the way through the landing, down the stairs. And then Rolandis was dragged through the back and that's where our CCTV supports that version of events. Coming up, the pressure builds on mother and son. Will mistakes be their downfall? The trainers in the box have clearly got blood staining. It was the one forensic breakthrough that we'd had, which then put Mantis with Rolandus. From the interviews, from the mobile phone data, from the CCTV, we were able to move this forward and take this case to the CPS. Rolandus Poscus was found on the 15th of June 2018 in Hull. Two arrests had been made, his partner Janina and her son Mantis. Police suspected that she was protecting her son who had been involved in Rolandus' death. Would crime scene forensics, phone analysis and CCTV footage prove enough to convict the mother and son? Once we put it to her that there had been a significant amount of blood throughout the property, our case became very strong against her. She denied ever seeing that amount of blood, and she also claimed that any blood that had come from Rolandus that was in the house would have come from a cut that he'd sustained to his ear in the days that they were moving in. It was just fanciful that it would have just come from a, a simple cut to her ear. There are very few human beings who would ever have a blueprint of how to carry out and deal with a murder. It's a very tiny proportion of individuals who have that mindset. Most, once it's occurred, panic. They don't have a clue what's next, and then their behaviours become so erratic that the police are led straight to them. Would mistakes prove to be the downfall of whomever was responsible for Alandis's murder? Just after 1.32 a.m. on the evening the police suspected Rolandus had been murdered, CCTV captured Mantis coming to the front of the property towards Rolandus' Saab car. It would be the key evidence for the police. One particular issue that Mantis had was that Rolandus' Saab was old. We saw initially from the CCTV footage that Mantis couldn't get into the driver's side door. He had to go through the passenger side in order to get into the vehicle or to unlock the driver's side. And we could see this figure who we identified as Mantis getting into the vehicle and reversing it to the rear of the property. We also discovered on the phone uh, there'd been a Google search of how to unlock a Saab boot. That was a clear indication, A, that they were using the Saab and B, that they were trying to hide something within the vehicle. Police searched CCTV to see where that vehicle went and if it would lead them to the park where Rolandus' body was found. We obviously didn't know the route, so we've still got a lot of CCTV to trawl through. It's a very painstaking job. Um, even just one camera that may have shot for 20 minutes, you can't just sit and watch it for 20 minutes. You have to go over it and over it and over it in order to get the finer detail. Careful analysis of the CCTV revealed some crucial evidence. We then managed to find some footage where we could actually find the Saab being driven towards Dane Park. We were able to see the headlights reflecting off the street furniture and, and vehicles parked. And we were also able to see Dane Park Road being residential has got speed bumps. You could see as the car went over the speed bumps the, the lights reflecting further in the distance. So we were then able to see exactly when they reached uh, the point where they'd left the body. With a solid timeline, the police now needed to find the Saab, hoping forensic could prove Rolandus' body had been moved in it. 
and that Mantis had been in the car. Mantis knew they had to get rid of the Saab. Due to the ferocity of the attack, there would have been Rolandis' blood in that vehicle. Um, so from examining his phone, we found that he'd been in touch with scrap dealers the next morning to try and get rid of this vehicle. And through our inquiries, we found the vehicle scrapped the next morning. It was either in the bottom of a shipping container or it was on its way abroad somewhere to be, uh, to be fully scrapped. So that completely ruled out any forensic work. Forensics in, in a lot of crimes of this nature plays a huge part. It makes it difficult, it puts obstacles in the way, but through painstaking work and professionalism and dedication in order to get the right result, it can always be overcome in some way. Fortunately for police, Mantis was further exposed as searches at his home unearthed a major piece of damning evidence. The property that he lived in uh, was an old uh, Victorian terraced house. In the outhouse, we found a box which contained a pair of trainers. The box was uh, an Under Armour uh, box for a pair of trainers, and within it was a pair of Nike trainers. Uh, so clearly not, trainers and box did not match. Also within the box was a receipt. From the receipt, we had a shop where the, the, the trainers had been purchased and a time and even a cashier's name. So we were able to then go back to that shop for that specific time and find the CCTV. The CCTV clearly showed Mantis walking into the shop, purchasing the trainers, and then leaving the shop. The trainers in the box had clearly got blood staining, was the one forensic breakthrough that we'd had, which then put Mantis with Rolandus. With the evidence stacking up against Mantis, police turned to proving Janina had been involved in the cover-up of the murder. We were able to see from Janina's phone that at the time that the car was travelling, which we obviously knew from the CCTV, that she was attempting to contact Mantis. At the time that Rolandus was being disposed of, Janina had contacted Mantis. The telephone call had lasted for about two and a half minutes. It's not unusual that a mother would wish to protect her child at all costs. But a mother should never have placed her child in a scenario where he could cause such an injury to another human being. There's nothing, there must be nothing left. Nothing must come back to you. So the fact that she helps him clean up the mess, that demonstrates that she's fully aware and fully willing to be part of this situation. Other critical CCTV captured in the days after the murder came to light. Mantis was seen in a mini market. Police noted his limp, potentially the result of injuries he sustained when carrying out the brutal assault. And surprisingly, Mantis was even caught on camera returning to where he dumped Rolandis's body. From the interviews, from the mobile phone data, from the CCTV inquiries, and also from the forensic, from the trainers, we were able to move this forward and take this case to the CPS. On the 3rd of December 2018 at Hull Crown Court, Mantis and Janina's trial began. Mantis was charged with the murder of Rolandus and Janina assisting a murderer. Neither had previous convictions for offences of violence. I was at court every day of the trial. Um, there was no emotion and no contact with Janina or Mantis, uh, even though they were sat in the dock next to each other. They completely ignored each other and didn't show any emotion whatsoever. There didn't appear to be any physical contact between them. There was no words exchanged, and it was very much a cold relationship uh, once they got into the dock at court. He said he admitted assaulting Melandus, uh, but he said it was in self-defense. It was Rolandus that had tried to hit him first. It was purely self-defense, and then he said uh, Rolandus had fallen down the stairs, and that's what caused all his horrific injuries. Considering the fact of how brutal these injuries were, it didn't seem like at all correct as to what happened. Bear in mind, it was her partner, albeit they'd only been together for a year, it's still a partner that you expected as, at some point, has been a loving relationship. She's shown no emotion at all throughout this whole process towards Rolandus. It was down to a jury to decide the fate of the mother and son. Guilty. Mantis was convicted of murder and given a life sentence. 
with a minimum term of 19 years in prison. It was a good sentence, and I think it reflected the ferocity of the attack. Janina was convicted of assisting an offender and given a two-and-a-half-year prison sentence. Janina, I think she expected to have a suspended sentence, but I was pleased that she got a custodial sentence um, because of her involvement in this offence. She's not even shown any real remorse. She certainly has shown no feeling with regards to her son as well, who's obviously now facing 19 years in, in prison. So the fact that we managed to secure a conviction against her was very, very satisfying in the end. Janina is one of those individuals who feels that if she lies enough, then people will believe her. But unfortunately, the British legal system is very clear. If you admit your culpability and if you take responsibility, then you are less dangerous than those who refuse to be accountable. So she is tried and prosecuted and imprisoned, rightly so, because she never admits her part. The third individual who police suspected had been involved in helping Mantis move Rolandis' body was found not guilty at court and acquitted. Senior investigating officer Chris Calvert was now able to inform Rolandis' family of the outcome. The only family he has is a 70-year-old mother and sister, and they still live in Lithuania. It was really nice to give Rolandis' mother that call uh, to say that they'd been found guilty. The dedicated work of the major crime team at Humberside Police was instrumental in Mantis and Janina's convictions. It's really important that I get justice for the victim and the family, but not only that, for the community. We concentrated on the detail here, on the detail of the mobile phone data, on the detail of, of hours and hours of looking through CCTV to build up this timeline. And that was through a dedicated team working long hours. We, myself, and the rest of the team do get a sense of, of pride from it. Um, but equally, as professionals, we know that's job done and we now move on to the next one. Coming up, an online stalker pushes his victim to the edge. This person was always there. It was like they knew my thoughts. It was like they, in a way, controlled me. It was a constant worry of what would happen next. It had all the warning signs of a, a really high-risk stalking case. Harassment and stalking are crimes that can devastate victims' lives. And in some cases, tragically, they end in murder. And in a digital world, stalking can take place all too easily and frequently. This is the case of Amanda Playle. Amanda and her husband Paul were childhood sweethearts. We got married in the Dominican Republic. My family came with me. I was actually lying by the pool. My dad sort of looked at his watch and went, don't you think you should go and get ready now? All of us, all in that group, were so, so happy. We thought, this is it. Three children followed and life was going well, but things changed in 2009. Paul had been made bankrupt. He said he kept it from me so that I wasn't worried and he thought he could deal with it, but it got out of hand. I realised that maybe we didn't have the money that he said we'd had. My husband lent him 23 and a half grand uh, to Paul and he said, look, I'm lending you this. He said, um, so that we can keep the grandchildren in our home. With their relationship on the rocks and financial worries, Paul suggested that they move for a fresh start away from Surrey to East Sussex. I found myself a job, found myself some friends, and thought I could build a bit of a life here. Over the next few years, life settled down and Amanda's confidence returned. She made new friends and was keeping in touch with old friends on social media. I got a messenger from my Facebook and the name on the message was the name of an ex-boyfriend and I was like, oh. So I messaged back, oh, long time no speak, how's life treating you? And I remember saying, life would be really good if someone picked me up, put me on an island with a good book and a cocktail, I would be in heaven. 
When we get bored in our relationships and something makes us feel attractive, even though we know that we're not going to do anything about it, we kind of want to keep that for ourselves because it makes us feel good. And that's what's happening here. It's not deception. It's just wanting to contain that flirtation and enjoy it. It probably was a little bit flirtatious, but nothing along the lines of, you know, I'm going to... Until one of the messages said, how about meeting me for a drink and we can see where this goes? And I was like, actually, I might not be very happy in my marriage, but that's not where I'm looking to go. It's just, uh, you know, gone on with his life, gone on with mine. Sadly, for Amanda, that wasn't to be the case. All of a sudden, the whole thing just completely changed. I'd got a, a message that we've quite an explicit sort of, does your family know that you're this and you behave like that? And it was really quite rude and explicit. He calls her names and he's very aggressive towards her. And that's a huge shock because remember, she'd been enjoying this really casual flirtation and now she's being threatened. Phone would just bleep and bleep and bleep. Uh, I mean, you, you, you either couldn't delete it or reply quick enough. It was just insane. By now, I was getting WhatsApp messages as well as text messages, and it was just way out of control. Whoever this human being is, they've managed to infect all her technology, making her feel that she's constantly visible. And that is absolutely horrifying because suddenly her very private world has become unsafe. There'd be things on my Facebook as if I'd wrote a post, you know, I'm, I'm leaving poor, I want to start a better life with someone else. I didn't write that. And, um, you know, I'd try and delete the post. And it went on for about a week and in the end I was like, oh my goodness, I can't control my Facebook, but people are thinking I'm writing these posts. You know, he was my rock. He was like, don't worry, we'll, we'll get you a new phone, we'll change this. For a short time, the messages stopped. I was in the shopping centre and my phone pinged and it was an email and it said the name again, so... And it was like, hello, I'm back. I instantly went, how the hell have you got my email address? And then suddenly, it comes back, but in a completely new context. It's stalking. Reply, come, I can get anything I want. There's nothing I don't know about you. I used to run a lot. I liked running. And I'd get a message just seeing you go past. I'd be like, don't be stupid. Yeah, you're wearing a grey tracksuit, a bobble hat and um, night trainers. I'd be like... But you'd look around and there was no one there. But you look at everyone and think, are, are you are you him? I got an email one morning that said, um, oh, so you do listen to our song in the car. And I don't know why, I just knew instantly then that there was something wrong with my car. My car door was open just ajar and all my CDs were lined out on the front seat. And that's when I went, oh my God, this person has been to my home. Imagine knowing that only feet away her violator has been. I mean, that makes you think, what next? In a further twist, the stalker had somehow been able to contact other members of Amanda's family. Everybody started getting these texts. He seemed to know where we was, where we were going, what we were doing. We were, we were, we were frightened. My mum and dad would be getting emails going, oh, do you know when Amanda goes out? She's um, not actually with her friend. She's meeting me in a hotel and we're, we're getting up to mischief. <laughs> we were, I wanted Amanda to come home so we could keep an eye on Amanda, see what's going on, protect her. It starts with that one nasty message and before you know it, you're in, if someone's controlling your life. In February 2017, having endured over a year of abuse, Amanda reported the stalking to the police. She said to us that she was going to the police. And her dad said, I think that's a good idea. You should go, Amanda, take all your bits and pieces, go down to the police station. Paul didn't want her to go. We said to her, no. Did. He said, no, you go down that police station, Amanda. He said, we need to get this sorted out to find out where it was coming from and to end this because you were worried every day. They took a statement and it came back with, it's not a lot we can actually do, you know, because there's no evidence. 
I will give you um, a victim support number. It was deflating to pluck up the courage and go to the police and get that response. Amanda wasn't aware that behind closed doors, Sussex police had passed on the statement and her case was to be reviewed. I realised that we could probably look at some different lines of inquiry in terms of the online abuse and the accounts that have been used. We had some enhanced training around stalking uh, provided by the charity called Paladin, coincided with this, this report kind of coming in. So I gave it to David, the, the case officer. This person was hiding behind social media, hiding behind the internet, a faceless perpetrator. He was almost like a ghost. Some days, I mean, Amanda was getting 100 messages, and they were all formats, um, emails predominantly. The behaviour that was being portrayed by the ex was, was really quite bizarre. There was some very, very personal information that was being sent to her about her extended family, and that really stood out. And then when I talked to Amanda on the phone and realised the, the scope of it, so it wasn't just herself being contacted, it was her husband, you know, family members and, and friends, um, it had all the warning signs of a, a really high-risk stalking case. Computer forensic work around the online profile of the stalker came back with insufficient information to lead them to the offender. Things, though, were about to take a dramatic turn. We got a report, Amanda called us to say that her husband Paul had been uh, mugged in London. And she said that the stalker had sent her a message saying something along the lines, it's going to be a bad day. He had a little bit of a black eye, said as they'd run past, they'd punched him and took the phone and... <sighs> then he'd said, um, you know, on his emails that the ex-boyfriend that was doing all this had said, you know, ha ha, I've got your phone. It looked like the stalker was now instigating assaults on her family. So, hence the, the risk raised and, and the police officer outside her door for 24 hours. We just didn't know what he was capable of. Coming up, the stalker's identity is revealed. I was told the message was, this beating's for your wife. Tell her to watch her back. It was like someone ripping your eye out. You just could not believe it. Amanda Playle had endured 14 months of hell at the hands of a stalker before going to the police. After chatting online with an ex-boyfriend, he turned abusive, carrying out a campaign of threatening harassment. Now the stalker had even targeted her parents and close relatives, armed with private personal details, causing the family to get suspicious of each other. Well, my husband said, this is not coming from Mandy's ex-boyfriend. This person knows too much in our lives. He said, it's one of us in the family. He said, it's one of us. And I said, oh, he said, it could be you. He said, what, me? I've got to a point where I don't know who to trust anymore. Just so, do you know what, all I've got is Paul. He's the only one that understands. He's the only one I can trust. The police were building intelligence and were also growing increasingly concerned that the stalker was not what he seemed. I got a phone call from Dave Sanker to come down to the police station, the local one. I remember it so clearly. We were sitting in a room, Steve come in, we did all the niceties, how are you, and chit-chat, and then he went, Mendo, we're going to go and arrest Paul. I, I actually thought I was going to be ill. I was like... But, but, but why? 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 And he said, you know, and I remember saying, no, it's not, it's not Paul, it's not Paul, it has to be this person. When I told her, she just broke, broke down in tears. <sighs> felt like the world had just fallen away. How could the man that she's known her entire life, the man that she's trusted, shared a bed with, raised a family with, be the one person trying to destroy her? So, of course, she feels that they're incorrect. It was like someone ripping your eye out. You just could not believe it. You couldn't take it. Paul. We went back with Amanda and I arrested Paul. If Paul was the stalker, the risk to her was significant psychologically, if not physically. His initial reactions were over the top, I would suggest. Uh, he began to hyperventilate, trying to look like he was in shock. I could see some traits in him 
that I'd seen in some other domestic abusers, um, mainly that kind of, I'm the victim in this, what are you doing this to me? We searched his car, and within his car, in the glove box, was the phone that he'd reported stolen in Croydon. So I said to him, is that the phone that was stolen? And his reply to me was, I don't know. So following the first part of the interview, I went and examined the phone, turned it on. The first picture is him and Amanda, uh, Disneyland. It's his phone. His response to that was the stalker must have put it in his car to stitch him up. I, say, I even said to him, you know, how is the stalker stitching you up? Because he didn't know you were going to get arrested. Because I didn't know you were going to get arrested till 10 minutes before I came and arrested you. An iPad that was seized provided further revealing evidence. Contained within the iPad was messages where he'd clearly logged into Amanda's Apple account. Uh, all her iMessages between her and her friends were within his messages. He also had pictures of messages on this iPad, which only could be taken from Amanda's devices. I know that the various accounts were tracked back to the home address, including one of the Facebook accounts um, by the ex, or uh, in the ex's name. All stuff that was indicative of him being this person. We just needed to really concrete um, those connections. Paul was bailed with conditions that he could not go home or contact Amanda. Despite that, the threatening messages and Paul's controlling behaviour continued. The girls that I worked with every May went on um, like a, a girls' holiday to Benidorm. Never ever gone on holiday on my own, ever, so I was like, I'm going to go. But on the day that she was due to go, um, Paul went missing. Um, nobody could find him. And it was during that time that Amanda started receiving messages from Paul saying that I've now received messages from ex-boyfriend saying that when you go away, you are going to be kidnapped, you are going to be raped, um, don't go. And about an hour before I got, uh, was getting on the plane, I got a voicemail from Paul. Um, Please be careful, he was really crying where you're going. Um, I was abducted last night and beaten up and um, I was told the message was, this beating's for your wife, tell her to watch her back in Benidorm. Amanda went off, none of what Paula said had happened. There was never any report made to the Metropolitan Police that he was, there was an attempted abduction. I spoke to him and he said, no, 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 because if I make a statement, your life's in danger. And I said, but my life isn't in danger because I've got the police, I've got full protection. We didn't quite have enough evidence, so if I'd arrested him at that point, we would have just ended up releasing him. So I, I had to manage the risk, but look at how I was going to deal with that situation. With Paul firmly in their sights, the police waited for a breakthrough. It wasn't long before it presented itself. An interesting phone message from the so-called stalker. In June, I was on the phone to Amanda, and it was while I was on the phone to her, she received a text message. As usual, my phone was pinging crazy different messages, and one had popped up that was quite quite unusual. It was um, a picture, and it said, Welcome to Gatwick, underneath with the message. This is it. It's over now. I'm leaving the country. I um, immediately phoned up our AMPR department, gave them Paul's registration number for his vehicle. Gatwick is one of the most secure airports in the country. There's a lot of uh, police cameras, um, access cameras into and out of Gatwick, and that allowed us to go and do AMPR searches, uh, automatic number plate recognition searches. We were able to identify Paul's car going in to Gatwick five, ten minutes before that. The message was sent to Amanda. He's taken a picture of this Gatwick South Terminal, and then you see him leave it. Yeah, that was, that was quite a pivotal moment. That's why I made the decision that we'd go up and arrest him, because we knew we were going to get a charge at that point. The one thing I did with Paul was to talk to him about where he'd been on this particular time and date when this message had been sent. And he was very adamant to me that he'd finished work, he'd gone back to where he's living. He parked his car on the driveway, he went to bed. He had the car key. It's only one car key. No one else drives the car. So he was pinned to that account. 
So we got out a picture, uh, which basically said, this is your car driving into Gatwick, and asked him to account for that, and he couldn't. He had to concede it was his car. It was time for police to reveal their trump card. And we produced another picture, which is a picture of Paul with a phone in hand, basically taking the picture of the South Gatwick terminal that was then used in that message. And he denied it was him. He was wearing the same shoes he was wearing in the interview. And I could happily say, that definitely is you. He, he said it wasn't. Paul was charged with Section 4A stalking and remanded into custody. Whilst being held, and up until Paul's trial, no further messages were sent to Amanda. On the 17th of November 2017, Paul Plale's case was heard. So in terms of Amanda, through this investigation, uh, it was evident she didn't want, want to believe it was Paul, and I totally understood that. So we ran that whole investigation, got all the way through to court before she truly believed it was Paul. I got into the witness box and I was given a pamphlet of like what the jury was seeing. It fell open on this picture of Paul stood at Gatwick taking the picture. And I looked at him in the dock and I remember I just wanted to scream at him, really? I thought, myself, how could you do this to my daughter? The girl that you say you love, you've ruined her life. Despite conceding he'd taken the photo in police interview, in court, Paul claimed he'd been forced by the stalker to take the photograph, concerned about his and the family's safety. It was just farcical, absolutely farcical. I just sat there and was, have you been watching a James Bond film to get this plot? Um, where did you get this plot from? He was a, he was a pathological liar, he had no real solid defense. Um, he just kept saying, it's not me, it's not me. Just wouldn't take any responsibility for anything. It turned out that his iPad was a mirror copy of my phone. He had my Apple account on there. Every message, every email that I was getting, he was reading just as I was. Paul has that sense of wishing to be a megalomaniac. He could be her persecutor and he could be her savior. He liked playing the game of being the most important human being in her world. The verdict was unanimous that he was convicted of both stalking and control and coercive behavior. So you'd normally either get the control and coercion, or you'd get the stalking. That he was doing both, quite a unique conviction, I would suggest. He was given a sentence of three years and six months for stalking and three years and six months for coercive behavior. But the sentences ran concurrently. So, after serving a year and three months, Paul was released on license in March 2019. A restraining order was put in place with risk of another prison sentence should he breach it. Will it all start again? Does the need for him to try and prove that this ex-boyfriend does exist, if he's not ready to admit or accept that he's done this, where are we all going to go from here? I think Paul honestly convinced himself that there's someone else and not him. And I think if he speaks to him now, he's still say, I'm not, I'm not guilty, because I think he believes he's not guilty. There's nothing in this world that I wouldn't give to have 10 minutes with him and say, Paul, why? Everybody wants it black and white, you're a good person or you're a bad person. But Paul was a very good husband for a very long period of time. You can't eradicate memories, you can't eradicate the good times. You can only recognize that they've changed. But I would really warn Amanda, because if he's capable of damaging her to such a degree, then he is capable of doing it again. Amanda is very thankful for the thorough investigation carried out by Sussex police. I honestly and truly believe that if it wasn't for their help and support, I don't think I'd be here today. And I hope for other victims out there that it gives them some courage to come forward. If you feel that you are being sought, go to the police um, if you feel comfortable enough to do that. So always make sure friends and family are aware 
of what's happening. Look at support networks such as Veritas and, and Paladin. And importantly, if you're being sent gifts or letters or messages, you keep them. Even now, I, I don't know what Paul's endgame truly was, but one of the things that Amanda has also said to me was, if I hadn't called her to tell her that we were going to do something, she was suicidal. And that actually may have been where it ended, with Amanda taking her own life, because the psychological pressure on her was huge, really extreme. Now, much has been done by government in recent years to try to improve how the criminal justice system tackles stalking. The Protection of Freedoms Act 2012 created two new offences of stalking to protect victims and bring perpetrators to justice. We have to keep learning from a case like Amanda's. Expert policing and brave victims working alongside each other were the key to a successful conviction in this case.